I originally had a plan for eight seasons. That's a lot. I would say I would need at least four seasons to provide a proper ending. You know, which one is the real day? Um, Hello, everyone. Today's video is a bit different than the usual stuff that we post here. If you have been keeping up with our channel, you know that Foundation has been the number one show that marked 2023 for us. We adored the series' second season for the most part. Especially after that epic season finale, we cannot wait for season 3 already. So, you can only imagine how excited we were to get the chance to interview the legendary writer of the show, David S. Goyer. You might know Goyer as the writer of Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy, as well as the Blade franchise. And now, he is blessing Hollywood with Foundation, a very philosophical sci-fi series. We can talk about Goyer and how we adore him for hours. But let us not bore you any longer and jump right into our interview. Hope you enjoy it. Okay, uh, first of all, very nice to meet you. Uh, I'm a big fan of your work. Um, let me start with somewhat of a personal question. Uh, I know that you worked on uh, very epic projects before, like Dark, Dark Knight franchise or Blade. And I was mm -hmm. wondering how Foundation challenged you in comparison to these previous works of yours. What was your biggest concern in accepting the project? <clears throat> well, in the case of Dark Knight or Blade or Superman, other things that I've worked on, um, there had already been, um, you know, at least comic book or visual depictions of these stories. Uh, 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 in the case of Batman and Superman, there had been television shows and cartoons and live action versions. So on one hand, there was a, a preconception for the wider audience, whereas this, nothing had been adapted before. Um, it was also, the source material is over 70 years old and it's complicated source material. Uh, it, it It's very anthological. The first book is just a series of short stories where almost none of the characters transfer from one story to the next. There's huge gaps in time. Um, really, the original Foundation books are an anthology with a series of different casts jumping from story to story. Mm -hmm. And we knew if we were going to adapt it, that we couldn't do an anthology, that there needed to be a continued story. So that was one of the biggest challenges. And then there were cultural challenges or sociological challenges because it's there are very few women uh, in the first three books. I don't believe there are any characters in the first book at all. It's implied um, that most of the characters are Caucasian and, and, and men. And, you know, we live in a very different world. So the audience that would be receiving Foundation today is very different from the heavily male-dominated audience that were reading the original stories and the original books. Mm -hmm. And so there needed to be some kind of balancing and um, we needed to include, um, you know, other genders, other races, you know, things like that. It was, it was complicated. And the things, science fiction always functions best as a metaphor. <clears throat> so the things that Asimov was drawing from in a post-World War II environment, we, we live in a very different world these days. And, and technology like AI and cloning exists that didn't exist when he was originally writing these things, which I believe he would have incorporated into his writings uh, had they existed 70 years ago. So by far the most complicated adaptation I've ever attempted. Yeah, um, actually, it's great that you <clears throat> jumped into the adaptation process because uh, I was going to ask you, what was the essence of the original material in your opinion i mean uh the essence that you taught when you read the uh, material this should be protected at all costs regardless of the struggles of the adaptation process you know obviously the, the character of harry selden um was incredibly important mm -hmm. uh the idea of setting up a foundation at the far reaches of a galaxy Mm -hmm. uh, the idea of a galactic empire, mm -hmm. uh, we had to personalize that. The galactic empire, the original Cleon in the books is, appears 
fleetingly, but isn't really a, a drawn out character. So mm -hmm. Harry, the Galactic Empire, uh, psychohistory itself, the idea that a mathematical formula could predict the future. Mm -hmm. and, and fundamentally, the theme of whether or not uh, us humans as individuals, whether or not our actions matter or whether or not our actions affect the course of history or whether we're all just kind of doomed and our fate is sealed. I mean, that that, that idea is is fundamental in the Asimov books. There's, a, there's something called the great man theory that mm -hmm. some people have had, whereas every once in a while history will create a great man who by sheer force of will alone can change the course of history. You know, Attila the Hun, um, <clears throat> very, you know, Hitler, not that he was a great man, but that he was yeah. someone that single-handedly changed the course of history. Um, and even in Asimov's writings, there's always been a tension between, he seems to waver between, yes, an individual can change history, and no, it's all about mass action. We, you know, he created the mule, which is an in individual that blows apart the plan. And um, so that was another kind of theme that I think was critical in retaining uh you know and also that it be that it be thoughtful that um yes we have more space battles and we have more action than asimov had mm -hmm. but that many times um solutions are arrived at through rationalizing things through thinking our way out of problems i mean that's that's a very asimov thing and then of course in the original books there wasn't a robot character, but in the prequels, he brought in a character named Demerzel, who was actually in the iRobot books. And robots part of Asimov's writing, and they were very soulful characters. And so that was a big, important thing that when I was originally working with Josh Friedman, we decided to pull the Demerzel character from the prequels into the modern day story. And so in the background, there's also a story about humans and robots and and whether or not um, they are better stewards of the galaxy than humans are. That that tension is also something that we thought was critical to preserve. Mm -hmm. um, as you mentioned, um, it's a very grand story. There are lots of characters and it's quite complex, actually. Uh, and I yeah. imagine to follow it, it's a... It's a struggle, you know, even I, I am watching the show and I'm like trying to be as careful as possible so that I wouldn't miss even a single scene. So I was wondering, how did you manage to um, simplify the story and present in a way that an average viewer can also keep up with? Look, it is a a complicated show with a large cast regardless um but we've seen examples game of thrones is one recent mm -hmm. example that had a very large cast mm -hmm. you know 25 ca main characters in the first season that and that defied conventional wisdom that you could have that many casts and i think a lot of audience members certainly myself struggled with the first season or two with game of thrones as well and keeping you know um trying to remember oh these characters are with this faction. These characters are with that faction. There's a lot of world building that we had to do. Uh, you have to trust the audience that on a big sh show, um, they will go with you. I do think season two is is easier to follow than season one because we had finished a lot of the main exposition. And if we go to a season three, I think season three will be easier to follow because we understand the concept of psychohistory we understand the concept of the foundation. We understand the concept of the, the clone emperors. Uh, all of those things we understand. They're part of the audience's vocabulary. And then we, many of the characters in season one and in season, season two are composite characters from Asimov. So mm -hmm. Gail Dornick is two of his characters that we combine into one. Gail Dornick mm -hmm. and Wanda Selden. Um, Hober Mallow is two characters. I believe it's uh, Lathan Devers and... And Hober Mallow. So, so in the characters are two characters combined into one. And in some cases, characters that were in, an, you know, originally Bell Rios wasn't in the same story as Hober Mallow. So we interwove those stories. Those were other ways that we tried 
to make it a little easier for the audience. Mm -hmm. um, so Foundation is a sci-fi show categorically and um, in terms of its, you know, setting, mm -hmm. etc. But I feel like it's also a very philosophical show because uh, we constantly have to ask ourselves some ontological questions throughout the show. Um, also, we are questioning our reality or the um, sense of destiny, etc. But the thing that impressed me the most during the season two was the question of the self through the story of the Cleons, because we basically see mm. Brother Day fighting with himself, his younger self and his yes. older self. And I was wondering, first of all, how did you manage to um, separate those three into three different individuals while, while keeping them the same at the same time? And also who the brother they really is? Who do you think he is? Look, we're hoping I'd like to believe that we created a show, yes, on the surface of science fiction, but I'd like to believe that we created a show that even people that don't think they like science fiction, mm -hmm. if they watch the show, would like this show because it is very deep. It is very philosophical. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of themes about memory. And if we don't have our memories, does that still make us who we are? Mm -hmm. um, if, if, there, if, if there are clones which one is the original one on um ontological questions as you ask and 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 that really is what excites me and the other writers and the other directors about doing the show is you know personhood with the robots personhood with the clones personhood with harry selden if he's a digital being is he a person or not if his memories have been redacted just like the cleons mm -hmm. are they still the cleons is, is he still harry selden Mm -hmm. These are the themes that kind of get us up in the morning. And in the cases of the three brothers, you know, which one is the real day? Um, it's, it, it's a really difficult question. Every one of them wants to believe that they can make a mark mm -hmm. uh, in their world, that they can be consequential. Mm -hmm. I think we all do in our own way, right? Um, but the very fact that in season three, we're dealing with Cleon the 16th, 17th, and 18th makes it very, very difficult uh, for them to really make a mark. Uh, they're imprisoned in the same way that Demerzel is imprisoned. Uh, so, you know, to a certain extent, um, we've given each of the brothers certain characteristics. So, you know, mm -hmm. Brother Dusk is more counseled. He's more wise. Uh, in some ways, really, he should be the one ruling. Um, Brother Don is is much more curious and impetuous and sometimes can be wooed by a woman or a man. Uh, and then and Brother Day uh, tends to be very egotistical um, mm -hmm. and and tends to dismiss his younger and his older brother, clone brothers. Um, you know, we do a lot of work with the three actors where they study each other's movements mm -hmm. and their cadence so that we can let that, you know, flow together. But one of the beauties of the show is hopefully if we get to season three, that genetic dynasty is fracturing. So they are starting to diverge from one another more and more and more and more. And and become more individual. But at the same time, that means the empire is fragmenting and falling apart. And I think you saw in this season, some of the brothers questioning or being suspicious of each other or plotting against each other. And that's certainly a direction that we plan to go into much more for season three, which is, you know, all of these clone bot brothers turning in on each other and fighting amongst one another. And you eventually could see a civil war between different imperial factions. That's very exciting for season three. Um, I was yeah. going to ask you, um, I mean, I feel like this show is one of those, it's get, it gets bigger and better with each episode. Mm -hmm. 
And I was wondering, what's the schedule for the future? Do we have a confirmation for season three? How many seasons would you like to have uh, for Foundation? We don't have a confirmation yet. We've written the scripts. Um, we've done early design work. Uh, uh, you know, now that the writer's strike is is over, mm -hmm. um, we hope to get word soon. Um, but the whole television landscape has been completely exploded right now. Yeah. So um, I imagine it, the, the show performed well uh, season two, so I'm fairly optimistic. But we don't have a, an official green light yet. I'm I'm hoping that will. I'm hoping that will come in the next month or so. Um, I originally had a plan for eight seasons. That's mm -hmm. a lot these days. Uh, I have enough story to tell for eight seasons. I don't know if we'll get there. Mm -hmm. um, I would say I would need at least four seasons to provide a proper ending. So I have certain benchmarks. If I know I have four, I think I, think I can end the show in a place where the audiences will be happy. Mm -hmm. If I know I have six, I could do it in six. If I know I have eight. So I'm hoping in my conversations with Apple in the next few months, I can get a bit more of an indication from them. If we do get a season three, how long they're thinking this might go, because that will help me uh, craft a satisfying ending for the show. Yeah. I'll be here to watch for sure. Thank you very much, David. Uh, it was very nice to meet Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Nice to meet you as well. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.